Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, today we'll talk about um, um, reproducible digital twins for the assessment of liver function. Um, yeah, mainly our research um, group is interested in, in in liver function, but I would say um, more in um, um, physiology in, in in general, and how we can um, better understand how how the how the human body and the the the, the human liver is um, detoxifying um, substances. Yeah, overall, we are um, interested in the um, um, metabolization and detoxification of um, a lot of medications and drugs. And um, the liver plays a, a key role in this um, in this detoxification. The main reason for that is that um, the liver is the metabolic hub of our, uh, our body and involved in most metabolic conversions and uh, metabolic pathways. Um, important part um, of this um, metabolic reactions are the um, drug detoxification reactions. And this is basically uptake and phase one, phase two metabolism and subsequent um, um, of an excretion in the bile or um, um, transport in the plasma so that subsequently the kidneys can remove the, um, um, the metabolites or drugs from, from the body. Um, an important question for us is... Um, how well the liver is functioning, and then so we need like some some readout or some measurement how how um, uh, how good liver function is, and there are um, some method to do that, but most of them have like some some problems associated with them. Um, the so-called gold standard for that is um, liver biopsy, which is um, basically taking a small piece of the liver and then um, uh, looking uh, at it under the microscope. Uh, a big problem with that is that that this is actual histology, um, but not not a functional measurement, um, and it also not of course not in not in vivo, but it's um, basically a tissue sample which you then analyze under the microscope. This is highly invasive. Um, you basically take a fifty thousandth part of the liver and like with a needle and so on. So you, there's nothing you would do like very often, but you only do this in um, very special cases. And you also have a lot of sampling and inter-observer variability, just meaning, okay, depending on where you put the needle and who is looking at this histology, you get very different results. So often this is um, this is often done in the context of um, liver function, liver surgery, and so on, but it's all not a very, very good measurement for actual liver function. On the other hand, what we often have is like access to um, so-called static liver function tests. This um, um, blood or plasma bio, biomarker um, which are um, routinely measured in the clinics. Um, these are single point measurements, uh, basically in a single blood sample, you, you determine the concentration of that. And um, examples for, for this are um, um, AST, ALT, or protrombin, albumin, bilirubin, um, a lot of things which are circulating in the blood. Unfortunately, this is, um, uh, these are no reliable marker to quantify liver functions. They're often like, um, they, they're pretty good um, to determine like that you're basically dying. Uh, let's say it like that. So it's like if half of your liver is like um, 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 uh, destroyed, you get a, a large increase in these markers, but they don't correlate well with a general liver function and, uh, and chronic liver function and so on. So, so overall, this is not a very reliable marker. So what we use instead is like a, a third approach, the so-called um, dynamical liver function tests. Um, and what it's, this is doing is basically um, um, determining liver function by using um, a test compound, which is specifically cleared um, by the liver. Uh, this allows um, um, to measure liver function in, in vivo by, by giving a test substance and then measuring the rate of disappearance of this test substance in the plasma or rate of appearance in the, in the urine. Um, depending on the pathway you want to test, there are different, different substances for that. Um, like for instance, you can use caffeine to test CYP1A2, inocyanin green for the ORTP, um, dextrometophan, CYP2D6, or clotzoxazone to test the CYP2, 2E1. And so mainly like the enzymes which are involved in the uh, transport and metabolization of this substances can be tested um, with, with such a substance. Um, we model, model um, these curves um, via physiological based pharmacokinetic models. This is, I would say, practically, this is a, a human physiology rebuilt in, in silico in the computer. And um, this provides like some kind of digital twin with which we can study how this um, um, drugs and test compounds are eliminated from the body. What we put in these models are processes related to ATME, to the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the substances. And then we can study with these models um, how substances appear and disappear from, from, the, from the body. 
these models are multi-scale models. Um, they couple basically the whole body scale via the um, circulation to um, to the organs and the and the cells. Um, very, very interesting. These um, models have high pharmacological and clinical relevance because they are pretty easy to individualize and stratify. So we can change parameters here. Um, for instance, related to body weight or age or um, or hematocrit and so on. Um, uh, and we can also include things uh, related to the pathophysiological processes. Like for instance, if we want to simulate kidney impairment or kidney function, we have a clear representation of the kidney in, in the model and parameters which are um, um, responsible for kidney function in the model. And we can change them and then um, um, try to replicate in the computer the, the renal impairment. And these models are so-called ordinary differential equations. Uh, models and the processes are involved um, involved are transport and metabolism. Um, we then have such models. What we can simulate with them is um, uh, such time courses. We can basically, um, in this case, like for instance, if you drank a cup of coffee, which contains around 100 milligrams of caffeine, then you can um, simulate how caffeine would appear um, in, in the plasma and how it would disappear um, over time. Like for instance, here, if you just drank a coffee an hour ago, um, we would see uh, peak maximal uh, concentrations of the caffeine appearing in the body and then a slow disappearance over the time course of um, a, a few hours. On the other hand, the, the main product of caffeine, paroxantine, is appearing over time. And this is due to the uptake of caffeine in the liver and then metabolization to paroxantine. Um, both caffeine and um, paroxantine are, are excreted uh, later on via the, uh, via the urine. And that's what these models scarcely can do. We can simulate different applications of um, drugs in this case, um, or medications in this case, caffeine, and then simulate the time dependent um, um, concentrations and amounts in different um, compartments of the body. A, a big challenge um, um, for such models, but I would say for um, um, systems medicine research in, in general is the large variability which, which we see in the population and the large inter-individual variability. So as every person is different and um, also has different liver function and has um, very different um, results in, 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 um, in blood tests or in, in such um, dynamical liver function tests. Um, what we try to do here is um, um, use computational models to better understand where this variability is coming from and understand how um, certain processes can change um, um, liver function and, and also the, the pharmacokinetics and the uh, dynamics of these substances. So then the following, I will show a few examples demonstrating what we can do and what are our like application fields of this field, of these models, and later on talk a bit about the reproducibility of, of these. So, a uh, big, big application field is like modeling disease. And then this is important because um, uh, uh, the people we are interested in are often old and have a lot of comorbidities. And um, so um, uh, we're interested in certain subsets and how, how certain diseases are affecting pharmacokinetics and also this um, liver function test. So in this uh, in this example, we, we develop a model of bravastatin, um, which is a um, statin used for lowering um, um, blood um, cholesterol. And we were interested in how hepatic impairment in, in the form of um, cirrhosis of different degrees and how renal impairment in the form of um, different um, glomerular filtration rates affects the pharmacokinetics of bravastatin. And this is an important question in the context um, of um, dose adjustments and um, do you have to be um, careful or in the treatment in certain subgroups, like um, especially in the, in the people who have um, hepatorenal um, impairment. So this model consists of a whole body model, which is basically distributed in bravastatin. Um, in the liver, bravastatin can be taken up um, and then uh, later on be secreted in the bile and via the enterohepatic circulation uh, reach the intestine and then um, ex be excreted in the feces. On the other hand, um, it can be excreted via the, via the um, urine. Um, via the urine, yeah. The, here are some examples where we studied them, the hepatic and renal impairment. Um, so on the one hand, we stepwise um, reduced the glomerular filtration rate in the model. On the other hand, we increased the uh, impairment of the um, um, cirrhosis, um, here measured via the CTP score, and then saw like what, 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 we, what happens. In the case of 
um, um, uh, in, increasing uh, impairment, so like going from a uh, like a healthy case to mild impairment to a severe impairment, we see a strong reduction here in the in the renal clearance of pravastatin. And our model predictions here, this um, solid lines are in, in good agreement with um, independent validation data for um, um, which reported the renal clearance. So we can see there's a strong effect of um, renal impairments on the uh, renal clearance of pravastatin. On the other hand, if we look at the area under the curve of pravastatin, which is a measure of like how much is still in the plasma, and we see like with increasing cirrhosis, we see a large increase in the area under the curve. But in addition, we have an um, effect of the um, renal impairment. So people who have um, hepatic and renal impairment have highly uh, increased um, area under the curves. But um, also renal um, uh, uh, renal impairment alone has like a, a small effect, but uh, cirrhosis overall um, uh, has a, has the biggest effect on that. So yeah, and we can see like we definitely have to, uh, should recommend here a dose adjustment because in this case, if you have impaired um, uh, liver and kidneys, you have very high um, plasma pravastatin concentrations under a typical dose um, of of pravastatin. So that was one example. Other examples of such models is like um, application in a um, surgical context that we can basically study um, in silico um, um, uh, hepatic um, uh, operations um, such as um, hepatectomies. Um, to study that, we, we developed a model of um, ICG, um, you know, cyanine green. Um, again, like it mainly distribution and uptake, uh, distribution of ICG in the body, um, some uptake and subsequent biliary export. And then we use the model to study um, anthropometric um, factors such as age, weight, and sex, effect of physiological factors like blood flow, liver volume, and the effect of disease. Um, but um, the most interesting part I would say is here that we um, also simulated surgical interventions and performed stepwise hepatectomies, um, um, seeing how this would affect the, the um, uh, function via ICG. And this is an important question because you want basically to know before the operation or the hepatectomy, um, if you cut um, certain amounts of the liver away, do you still have sufficient fun function left after the operation for the uh, patient to survive uh, or, or, and not show complications? Um, yeah, so in the first step, we um, um, calibrated the model um, uh, uh, and, and checked that our um, uh, modeling of cirrhosis um, is in agreement with the um, experimental data. For that, we used like reported ICG measurements from different studies um, for different um, cirrhosis degrees. And our model overall showed um, um, a very good agreement um, between the different, um, different readouts. So that was mainly a validation that if we change this parameter F cirrhosis in our model, we can um, very well uh, recapitulate um, what, will, what, what happens basically with the ICG clearance and elimination um, in cirrhosis. In the second step, we then simulated this um, in silico hepatectomies. So here you can see like we, we did a stepwise resection. Uh, we cut more and more liver away. And we what we can in, in different cirrhosis degrees, and what we can see, we get basically an um, decrease in ICG clearance and PDL, increase in R15, and in, um, and then a strong increase here um, for the large resections for the half-life of ICG. And we see that uh, this has a strong effect um, that your health status has a strong effect, mainly on the baseline ICG rate, and then the hepatectomy is um, uh, resulting in a stepwise decrease. Uh, interestingly, this is not linear, but like we see like some large non-linearities, especially like here in the half-life, which is uh, highly, started to highly increase as soon as we start more, uh, cut more than 70% of the liver away. Validation was performed with independent data sets where we um, used different pre- and post-operative ICG measurements, and then did some, um, um, just basically looked um, if our model is able to predict this different time causes, and we see a pretty good agreement between this um, different readouts. Um, we took them a step further and we're interested, okay, can we use this model to basically predict the persons who will have complications and will have um, uh, will die after the operations? So measured by a 30-day mortality after, after hepatectomy. And um, interestingly, what we did then is um, or we basically used the post-operative predicted uh, model uh, ICG clearance or ICG R15 here um, uh, to predict um, survivors and non-survivors. So that's um, this blue shades are basically what we predict. And um, if we then just plot the, the survivors and non-survivors, we clearly see, okay, there's um, for this la larger values of, um, or the 
larger the ICG of 15 is, the higher the probability for, for you to die after the operation. So there's um, that here. And then we could use this predicted um, ICG of 15 as a, um, in, in a classification approach to um, see how, how well are we in predicting um, um, 30 day mortality. Interestingly, we are better than um, just using the data, the preoperative data, and we could show like a pretty high um, area under the curve if you use this model predicted um, ICG. So this was um, for me a very interesting outcome because you can basically use models to predict what would happen after you simulate them, the, the surgical intervention, the hepatectomy, and then use the data to predict um, um, outcomes. And um, that can give you the, like nice information for, for uh, or additional information if this operation should be performed or, or also how much of the liver you can cut away. Um, okay. Other questions which we ask with such models as, um, or can ask is what is the effect of genetic variants? Um, genetic variants can have a strong effect on the um, um, elimination of uh, drugs, but this is really certain variants and certain enzymes which, which show large effects. Um, one key, key example for that is a SUB2D6, where we have a different genetic variants which either have like a very high um, activity, then you're an extensive metabolizer and have low con concentrations of um, drugs metabolized by the substance, or or you can have like very uh, variants which have very poor function, and then you are very slow metabolizers and have much um, higher uh, plasma concentrations. Um, in effect, in the end, it's like a combination of what variants you have with, with how much function and how many copies of this functional variants you have. So often, like the the more the more copies you have, like the the better you metabolize and and vice versa. Okay. Um, yeah, we use this here in a model of um, dextrometophan, and um, the key idea is um, very similar to what I showed uh, until now. We build a physiological based pharmacokinetic model for dextrometophan, put all the processes in the different compartments. The, the only new thing here is really that we um, uh, model the different genetic variants for the CYP2D6, which is a key enzyme in the metabolism of dextrometophan. And what we did is we mapped the different genetic variants um, here uh, indicated by the stars to different activity scores, and then um, gave the different activity scores different KM and Vmax values. So basically scaling the activity and affinity of this variance um, based on the activity score. Now, um, after a lot of model um, calibration, in the end, we, we did some validation simulations. In this case, we try to predict the urinary cumulative ratio of dextrometophan to a different substance. I think the, the key takeaway is here, if you look at the simulations on the right and the experimental data here um, from, I think around 20 studies um, uh, integrated, you see like a pretty good agreement between the, the two things. Um, what we can do is now predict for uh, individual genetic variants, what is the expected distributions of this, um, of this marker and how this would change with the um, variant. Um, and we see the very poor metabolizers have very high of this, uh, high ratios of this um, dextrometophan to the metabolites ratio, um, whereas the uh, extensive metabolizer have a much lower, lower ratio. And we see a nice um, um, stepwise um, decrease of this ratio. And this is in pretty good agreement with, with the experimental data. But we clearly see that there's larger variability in the, um, or very large variability in the, um, in the experimental data, but also like here in the simulation, um, independent of the genetic variant. So genetic variant is not saying everything, but it allows you to give an overview where, where you expect the person to lie. We can do the same on the activity score levels. You also have pretty good agreement. And also if you look at the distributions and the cumulative mass functions, our model predictions are in pretty good agreement with this ratio. And so this allows by like um, combining activity values with the genetic variants for, for individual genetic variants and combination of variants to predict um, the metabolization of these drugs. We took this a step further and then uh, looked at the distribution of these genetic variants in populations. And we're interested if different populations show different distributions. Um, here again, measured via this urinary ratio. And we could see that in the um, uh, European um, population, yeah, we predict a lot of poor metabolizers, whereas the East Asians basically shouldn't have any poor metabolizers in here. And if we um, go and validate like that with um, experimental data, we can see very similar uh, distributions. The Europeans here are large poor metabolizers um, compared uh, with the Caucasians. And like the East Asians basically don't have any poor metabolizer phenotypes. Um, 
other things which you can do with such models is looking at lifestyle. Um, here, like for instance, um, how would smoking affect the clearance of caffeine or the use of oral contraceptives in, in, in women? how it um, reduces caffeine clearance. And you can see a clear stratification of caffeine clearance in these different subgroups. And so if you have this information about lifestyle and or co-medication, you can better predict the, the clearance and reduce this variability or this large variability, which we see here in the data. Um, we did this with a model of caffeine and then um, used the information of uh, smoking or, or contraceptive use to stratify the model. And then um, if we predict the pharmacokinetic parameters, we can show that we're in better agreement um, with the data if we um, use um, this stratification approach. But this um, basically shows the large effects of caffeine and you can use these models to um, better understand where this variability is coming from. In this case, it's a combination of um, that you have different subgroups who have very different caffeine clearance. And if you account for that, you better understand um, the variability. Similar things can be done, for instance, for alcohol consumption. In this case, this was a model of um, clotzoxazone. They were interested in the induction and um, of um, CYP2E1 via alcohol consumption and how this would um, go back to baseline after you um, um, are abstinence from, from, from alcohol. And this is an important question because um, this test is mainly used in, in alcoholics to determine the status of the liver function. And uh, as we can see here, alcohol consumption strongly changes um, um, the clotzoxazone clearance, whereas um, the, the abstinence uh, again uh, changes and brings it back to baseline. And the, this is of course important because especially the alcoholics, the, um, they consume a lot of alcohol and it's important how long they were abstinence and when they did stop drinking. Because if this is a strong confounding factor for this test, we um, um, such a computational model uh, approach allows to correct for that later on. Um, yeah. Overall, we established over the time a, a lot of these models. Some are like here work in progress, but um, yeah, uh, if you're interested in working with some of them, then um, yeah, uh, please get into contact. But overall, like we would say, like uh, this general approach of building physiology-based pharmacokinetic models, then looking at different um, um, interesting pathophysiologies and different um, application fields, is a, a lot of the work which we we're doing here. Um, at the end, I want to take um, a few minutes to talk about reproducibility and mainly about reproducibility of these computational models. Well, it's also like here, if we, I found this picture really nice because it shows also the problems of, probably the problem with reproducibility of real twins. <laughs> and we have the same issue like with um, the, uh, the digital twins. So like, uh, like on the first look, this looks pretty similar uh, or pretty identical. On the second look, this is um, there's definitely uh, differences which we can find. And, and the same thing uh, happens with computational models. So if you want to reuse and uh, replicate and reproduce models from someone else, you often get pretty close in the, in the actual uh, time courses um, and in the model behavior, but you uh, most of the time it looks more like that, that you say, okay, <laughs> It looks similar to what they did in their paper, but it's not, I can't really get the same thing out of there. So what we use a lot is like this um, um, uh, standard, standard, uh, standard, standardization approach that we um, use standard workflows and standard um, formats to encode our computational models and some of our, of our workflows. Um, a key piece are this um, combined standards with um, SPML, the systems biology markup language being a key, um, key piece in that. This is really the model uh, description language, but there are also standards um, for the um, um, archiving and the dissemination of information um, for annotating information with metadata and also like um, for parameter estimation and so on. And so we try to use it as much as possible and distribute it with the actual models. So um, SPML is this uh, model description language. Um, we use this basically for all of our models and it allows us to, to provide a reproducible and exchangeable version of our model other people can reuse or couple to or and so on. In, in our context for this digital twins and this um, digital physiology, it's um, it provides nice features of hierarchical model composition. And so we can build different sub models of different tissues or different processes and then couple them later on. And then this makes it often easier to, to break the problem into smaller pieces and work on smaller pieces and connect everything. And also to reuse things which we uh, have from different projects. It provides a lot of validations, for instance, on units, um, on equations and mass charge and so on. And it allows to annotate the information. 
um, we use this a lot for model coupling, um, especially coupling between different scales, for instance, here the whole body and uh, different organs. But we also use it like um, um, for coupling of, of different functions, like for instance, for use, uh, coupling models of pharmacokinetics to models of pharmacodynamics. And so in this case, we had a, a nice model of the pharmacodynamics of um, the um, simostatin, a statin drug, and how it affects like um, plasma cholesterol levels. And then we developed a pharmacokinetic model for pravastatin and um, could basically reuse the complete block here and um, um, just couple the two SPML models without um, re-implementing everything for the other models. Other examples are models of um, blood pressure regulation and so on, which we can use uh, to study different blood pressure medications, like for instance, the um, um, loop diuretics or the ACE inhibitors, because the general mechanism of the blood pressure regulation is very similar. And so we would use this more pharmacodynamic, we use this more pharmacodynamic models. Other things where this is important is um, model coupling, I would say, between different frameworks. Um, more complex models are often like not only ordinary differential equations, but you couple it to um, partial differential equations of uh, FBA models or Bayesian approaches and so on. And so also like having a um, standard exchange format and standard interfaces of your models makes it much easier to couple it to different approaches and do in the end model composition. Like one example is, for instance, here where we um, use like FEM based um, simulations, which are basically um, mainly for partial differential equations for the transport and mechanics of the tissue to couple that to ordinary differential equations on the cellular level uh, to describe metabolism or on the liver and whole body to describe the transport of substances um, on the whole body scale. Um, big thing is um, later on to distribute our models, but also on the data um, um, which belongs to the model in a, in a fair manner so that we basically um, make everything findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable. And there um, we basically provide all the resources, um, well-documented, um, easily accessible, and um, try to provide um, um, DOIs for people to, to then access this information. This doesn't work always, but okay, we try our best to make this as, um, as open and as reusable as possible. So yeah, thanks for your attention. Um, uh, I definitely have to acknowledge um, um, all the funders which um, provided um, support for this work and especially all the students who basically did all the work which I present now. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot for your attention. And um, yeah, if you have questions, um, please ask. Okay, um, so I have to try to stop the recording here. Um, and then, okay, um, do you want to?